All right, welcome back to the IE427 garage, everybody. I am headed upstairs. I want to uh, grab some parts for the 25th anniversary car. I'm going to see if I can get the clutch slave cylinder installed in the car. We've also got the coolant overflow tank that we probably ought to take downstairs and see about getting some brackets fabricated for that. And then uh, we'll see where this goes. All right, so this is the contents of parts that we have from Mike Forte. I know that we're not going to be using this, so we'll set this aside because we have one of Mike's triples that we ordered from him that we're going to be using for that. And then uh, we have his slave cylinder here, which I believe is a Willwood slave cylinder, and his custom machine billet bracket. That's going to go on the car. And then I think here next to it I have coolant overflow or surge tank as uh, everybody likes to call it right there so we're going to grab that we're going to take it downstairs with us as well and see uh, about fabricating some brackets because that's got to be mounted under the hood and we've got to figure out some routing for our coolant hoses music update stones you gotta move. All right, so here under the car, well, we're gonna take that tag off real quick. Um, we're basically gonna take this bolt out, we're gonna take this bolt out, we're gonna install the bracket right here with the spacers and the two longer bolts that Mike provides. And then we're gonna mount up the slave cylinder, which is over here. This bolts to the bottom of the bracket and then this fork or this uh, rod mounts into here and then this mounts on the shift fork. Mike even provides a braided line, an uh, AN3 line that goes all the way up to the master cylinder in the Willwood pedal box. So I'm going to get the bracket uh, bolted up and I'll bring you back. All right. This should be common sense, but a lot of that is lost in this brave new world. So, here's my slave cylinder. Here's the shaft. If you can see, there's a mark. I've made a mark on that all the way around the shaft. Okay, this little piece on the end slides off. You can see, it's, this is just a cut bolt. So, it's too long you're going to find that it's just too long to fit in there as it is, but you need some way of marking it. So what you do is put, put it into, I'm trying to hold this all, put it into the end of the, the slave cylinder, push it all the way in, and mark it. That's where my black mark is, uh, right there. Now what you're going to do is you're going to mount the slave cylinder back up to the bracket, Okay, so I've got the bracket mounted in here. Bracket is mounted right up there. Can you see that? Nice shiny piece of billet. And I've got the adapter to the fork right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the bolt through there with no nut on it so that the heim joint that goes on the end of it is going through there. And then I'm going to bolt the slave cylinder in place with the two bolts, just snug. And then I am going to put that in and measure it to my black mark, make a second black mark where the shaft is at rest against this portion, the end of the aluminum of the slave cylinder. And that's going to, the, the distance in between the two marks is my cut line. And I'm going to cut that much material off the end of this and then slide the um, the bushing that goes on the end back on it and then I should be right where I need to be. 
there should not be any preload on the clutch. With a cable, you can go get away with a little bit of preload because you're usually taking up the slack in the pedal with the preload of a cable actuated clutch. You cannot get away with that with one of these hydraulic ones. So don't try to preload the clutch because you will end up either destroying the throw out bearing or wearing the clutch out prematurely. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna get this in there, I'm gonna cut it to length and then I'm gonna put it all back together and see where we're at. Day Tripper, the Beatles. All right, I got everything tightened up. So I'll, I've got the bracket tightened up there. I'm happy with the way that it is operating. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna tighten up the stop nut right here. And then I have the hose going up to the master cylinder. And just like everything else, I put a little bit of synthetic dot three on there because that uses brake fluid for the hydraulic fluid and that's all ready to go. Aerosmith, last child. All right, I'm gonna include this simply because I've seen a lot of complaints, questions about the steering shaft on the Mark IVs. And I see guys out there cutting the double D shaft, the um, not, one, not the intermediate shaft, but the engine bay shaft. And there's really no need to do that. Um, I see other guys telling uh, the guys that are having trouble, just put the bearing on the inside. You, you don't have to put the bearing on the inside. The only time we put the bearing on the inside is when we, I, um, when we're running a power booster for power brakes because you need the extra cl clearance behind the booster in order for the um, universal joints to, to, to spin around. And sometimes you still have to clearance the back of the, the booster anyway. So let's just stick to manual brakes, Willwood pedal box, and the actual steering shaft. What you do is put your bearing in, put it in, put it in firm. You don't have to over tighten it. You don't, you know, don't leave it in there loose, but tighten it so it's snug. And then put in your intermediate and your uh, primary steering shaft, which is the one that uh, the steering wheel attaches to you. There's no need to put in your, your uh, um, Belleville washers at this time because you're most likely going to pull this apart at some point before you finish building your car. Um, and honestly, it, it's a pain in the neck to pull those apart sometimes if you put them in. So... What you want to do after you get the intermediate shaft, the primary shaft, and the bearing installed, push the intermediate shaft through the bearing, both the pillow block bearing at the top and the bearing on the firewall. And then you're going to loosely assemble the upper knuckle, the upper U-joint, and the lower U-joint. Do not tighten any of the set screws. That's where you're getting into trouble. You need all the flexibility you can to get the splined side of the connector on the U-joint down over the steering shaft that comes out of the rack. You can actually push this down farther than you need in order to adjust the um, engine bay shaft here. So. Once you get everything in place, you can see I am actually locked in to the center groove. I don't have the steering wheel uh, turned this way, but the, the, the set screw is right there. And it is in the center groove of the splines to lock it in. I have no shaft sticking out of the inside of the U-joint on this side. And I have no shaft sticking out of the U-joint on the other side. So you can see it. It's, it's nearly flush in here. And then I have no, I have no shafts uh, sticking out on this side here, and I still have a gap. This has not been cut. So if you're having problems, you're most likely doing something wrong. So stop before you cut and put it all together loosely. So this will slide all the way through. And that one down there will slide all the way through. And the one with the splined end that goes onto the rack will slide all the way through. Once you get it in place, then you can start adjusting things. And I always start up here. This is the first set screw I tighten. Because 
it's still not tightened on the bearing right here. The bearing will be the last things that you tighten the set screws on. This will allow this to, to go in and out of the bearing if you need some adjustments. So don't just start arbitrarily cutting stuff, guys, because you may not need to. Uh, I haven't seen one of these cars yet, and we've built a number of these going all the way back to the Mark 1s. And those had a completely different shaft in them. They had a, basically a straight shaft that came out of the side of the, the footbox. Um, the Mark III is when they changed them over to come out of the front of the footbox. And uh, there's been a couple of different configurations. We used to have different um, spline adapters for the end. Now the spline adapter is part of the U-joint. So I think it makes it even easier than having one more you know, point of failure with that adapter. But uh, regardless, if you're building a Mark IV and you can't get that steering shaft to go in without cutting, stop. All right, everybody, next day. Um, went on kind of a rant there, and uh, I, I just hate to see guys you know, waste effort and money on parts that they don't need to be um, modifying or possibly replacing. So... Um, keep that in mind as you do some of this stuff. Um, if you have a question, ask. There are plenty of places on Facebook, a lot of groups for Factory 5 Cars on Facebook. There are two different forums that are dedicated to Factory 5 Cars. Ask your question there because um, you can save yourself some time and some effort by just doing a little bit of investigation. I think I'm going to wrap this video up here. However, we did receive some parts. Um, I think I may have shown a picture of the Factory 5 heater box and how, yeah, it, it, there's a reason that Factory 5 states on their website that you cannot use the heater with their glove box. There's just no space in there. And even gaining the two inches of the Factory, what is it, the FF Metals uh, Firewall Forward Kit that we have in, there, uh, have in this car, there's still not enough room. So I had the owner... Um, order a hot rod heater kit from summit racing i think that's going to work but um i think we're still going to have to modify it anyways we uh we have the moroso um reservoir the surge tank and moroso i guess spend all this money on a tank they don't give you a cap so we had to order a um, stock ford cap that came in we got it right here so i've got it on the reservoir so we don't lose it so that I've got that um, and then over here I do have that heater kit that uh, came in the mail today and I think what we're gonna do we're gonna ditch the front cover and make our own because with the outlets coming out of the front that's going to go right into our glove box which isn't gonna work for us but it's easy to make a flat cover, so I'm not too worried about that. And then, because of the way this is built, it looks like we've got about a good inch here that we can actually cut the entire box back and then still manufacture a cover to fit over that. And then what I'll probably end up doing, here was the gasket that was in there. And I know they're, they're just trying to um, divert as much airflow off the front as they can. Um, so I think what we'll end up doing is we'll end up coming out of the side, like a, an outlet here that goes over to the driver's side, and then an outlet over on this side here to go to the passenger side. And I haven't pulled the actual heater core out yet to see if it indeed is all the way against the back of the case here. If it is, that's fine. I mean, what we did in Michael's car, um, we kind of just used the heater core as a, like a cube. Um, it was less about getting the air to go through the, um, the heater core than it was to pick up the warm, you know, the warm air that was inside the box. Um, cause we just didn't have the room and it's going to be the same thing on this one. Um, Michael's car, the, the heater still had plenty of, out, uh, uh, um, volume coming out of the ducts, um, because those ducts were two inch and I think we're going to do the same thing on here. We'll order either order some two inch duct and outlets or we'll use the ones that came with the original vintage air kit that um, uh, the owner got from factory five i don't know yet um, if we keep that vintage air kit all together we can probably sell it for close to what 
um, the owner paid for it. So I think it might just be best for us to just order some tubing and order some outlets um, and then keep that that one complete so he can sell that and uh, recover some of his money for that but uh, so we're gonna keep working on the 25th anniversary car but as you can see in the shop I've moved some stuff around the 25th anniversary car is out in front of the lift and we have Jim's car up on the lift now and so what I'm gonna do on Jim's car over the next couple days I'm gonna try to get the motor raised up so I can pull those spacers out both on the engine and the transmission and then that'll give me a better idea of what I can do with the clutch cable and the accelerator cable because right now those I kind of just put the car away with those half finished and uh, I don't want to get into a whole thing on Jim's car because uh, this is more about the 25th anniversary car right here however I had to move stuff around the shop and I had the opportunity uh, yesterday of getting some help to move the cars because even though Jim's car will start, there's no clutch cable, there's no accelerator cable. There is brakes, kind of. <laughs> We're going to have to re-bleed the brakes and I've got to go pick up some brake line so that I can redo that section of brake line in the back of the car. Um, so I think that's going to do it. I am uh, I am going to uh, finish out this evening just kind of tidying up some stuff around the shop and getting stuff organized so that I can work on Jim's car. I will see you guys all next time. I want to thank you guys all for watching. If you're enjoying the content, please do the like, the share, the subscribe, all that good stuff. Comment. Um, and we'll see you guys all next time. Have a great day.